What we're going to talk about today is a little bit, now that we've talked about contraction, how that can happen, and where we get the energy from, I want to talk a little bit about just kind of, in terms of stimulation and how often we go at, stimulate this muscle, what it really does to that muscle. So we're going to talk about what is called muscle twitch and really kind of taking a look at what happens in response to stimulation. Uh, again, some of this is a little bit more theoretical. Uh, we're going to see that, honestly, in normal human function, you cannot stimulate the muscle as fast as we're going to be talking about in some of this uh, some of these situations here. But what we're looking at is they've actually done studies with a muscle and electrically stimulating it using an, a, it's actually been done using a uh, muscle from a frog and then having a weight attached to it and then seeing when they stimulate it, how long it takes for it to contract, what that force is and uh, by changing a little bit about uh, how often they stimulate it, what are some of the changes that we see with this. So what we are going to be talking about is kind of these muscle, what are called myograms, these uh, measurements of muscle force over time. What we're going to see is when you first initially stimulate a muscle, there's going to be a certain period of time from when the actual stimulation starts to there's actually any change in or shortening of those muscle cells. Uh, this is what is referred to as that latent period. If we were actually asking what was going on here, this is that excitation and that traveling action potential before we start getting the actin and myosin to interact. That a period of time is going to be this latent period. We are then going to start getting the actin and myosin to kind of pull past one another. That is going to begin the contraction period. We're going to see this happens really quickly in skeletal muscle. And then after that, as that releases and goes back to a normal muscle tension, that is going to be the relaxation period. So if we look at a myogram here, you can see when if they were doing this and delivering electricity to this muscle, you can see there is this initial stimulus. There's a period of time where there's no contraction of the muscle. That's that latent period. It contracts contraction period, and then after the stimulation is over, that relaxation period. So, and again, those events are those three things, the latent period, contraction period, and relaxation period. So, what they did on this a little bit here is to look at a few different things, and again, this is going to be a little bit different in the body than it would be in this kind of more theoretical, experimental type of setting. Uh, if we're going to talk about recruitment, which is the next thing we actually look at here, in the study, what they did is they started turning up the voltage. What happens when you turn up the voltage, you're going to stimulate more muscle fibers to depolarize, more muscle cells to depolarize, which is going to mean a stronger contraction. In the body, what this is going to mean is it's going to be actually stimulating more motor units to send a signal to contract. But what they see in this experimental setting is that if you turn this voltage up, you're going to get an increased tension, increased tension until you get to a point of maximal contraction where you're stimulating all the muscle cells in this experiment. Uh, this idea is recruitment and you can kind of see this, any one muscle cell is going to contract in an all or none fashion. Either you stimulate that muscle it, cell, it reaches threshold and it contracts or it doesn't at all. What we do in the body to get a stronger contraction is we will stimulate more motor units. More motor units involved, more force. Less motor units, less force. When you do this in this experimental setting, as you turn up that, oops, oops, sorry, when you turn up this, what you're going to see is each time they turn up this voltage, it's going to trigger more muscle fibers to contract, which gets you to a stronger stimulus until you fully recruited, as we're seeing right here, all the muscle fibers in this experiment. The other thing that they started playing around with is changes in the frequency of the stimulation. Uh, if you were stimulating the muscle less than 10 times per second. What you can see is here is you get to do a full contraction and a full relaxation before it's stimulated again. So this is this idea of a normal muscle twitch back, full stimulation to full relaxation. What is kind of interesting on this one is you start increasing the frequency of this. You can see if we start going to between 10 and 20 seconds per stimulation, so a frequency of 10, 10 to 20 per second, excuse me, or 10 to 20 hertz. You can see you're getting a full relaxation each time, but you get this building strength of contraction. What is really thought that's going on here is this tension is increasing because what's happening, there's not enough time to pump all that calcium back out. The force drops away, but 
each subsequent stimulation, there's a little bit more calcium getting out there, which increases the amount of interaction between the actin and myosin fibers. And that is what's going to allow us to do this. This stepwise increase is called something called TREPA. So understanding what is going on with TREPA is something I would expect everybody to be able to do. But that is that frequency between 10 and 20 second, 10 and 20 per second, is going to lead to an increasing in muscle force up to full recruitment. That is that TREPA idea. As you start getting to higher frequencies, 10 to 20, I mean, excuse me, 20 to 40 stimulations per second, what's going to happen here is you're not able to have any relaxation occurring and you get what is called this wave or temporal summation uh, and it gets you to what is called this incomplete tetanus. After you go above 40 to 50 per second, you're going to get this sustained contraction where there's no relaxation, no loss of force whatsoever. And this is what is referred to as tetanus or tetany. This is this muscle going into full, full on contraction. If you were to grab on to something that was electrified, usually if you look at your plugs, it's 120 volts at uh, 60 hertz, which is 60 cycles per second, which would mean if you grab on something that was electrified, you would go into full tetanus, for example. And you can see this 20 to 40, you get this building here, but there's no relaxation happening. This is that incomplete tetanus. Once you get above 50 per second, you get this full on tetanus where the muscle goes into full contraction and is unable to relax until that electrical stimulation is removed. In the human body, we cannot stimulate at greater than 25 cycles per second or 25 hertz. So in reality, in a human body, we are getting no tetanus. Any sustained contraction in the body is what we're actually doing is cycling through different motor units within the muscle to sustain that contraction. Uh, if we electrically stimulate the muscle, we can actually put it into tetanus. If we were able to do lab, we actually were doing stuff with the muscle stimulator that we'd hook it up to your forearm muscles here and we could actually get this finger to contract and you could actually feel the tetanus. We're not able to do that this semester because of all the fun COVID stuff here but that would be the case and you would actually be able to experience this. What we're also gonna see a lot of times, we are somewhat slightly stimulating the muscle at times to provide some resting stimulation to a muscle called resting muscle tone. Uh, not enough to generate movement, but enough to hold you upright, for example. That is uh, kind of this postural muscles. If you wanna think about it, I have some resting muscle tone. Uh, generally, if you lose consciousness or you fall asleep, you lose this. And that's why sometimes if you see people fall asleep in class and we sit in there and they'll do this. That is that loss of muscle tone sometimes. Uh, the other thing I want to kind of talk about is this idea of that there is kind of these different types of contraction. You can have what are called isometric or isotonic contractions. Iso, if you know the prefix, means same. Metric means measure. Tone means tension. So if we're talking about an isometric contraction, this is a contraction that if you were, let's say, holding a, a bag up or something, you generate enough tension to hold that weight, but you're not bringing about any movement. So, and if you were to, or if you put a stack of books, let's say in your hand, you put one book on there, you're gonna have a certain amount of contraction force. As you stack more and more books and you're trying to hold them steady, what you're gonna see is the muscle tension is gonna increase and increase but you're not gonna see any change in the length of the muscle bone. There's no movement happening. That is an isometric contraction. Muscle stays the same length, but tension changes. So holding a weight, pushing on something, holding something up, these would be isometric contractions. Isotonic contractions, these are ones where the tension of the muscle overcomes the resistance and this results in movement. So, and if you were to move your arm, you'll see you get a certain tone in your muscle. And then as you contract, that tension of the muscle stays about the same, but you bring about movement. That's an isotonic contraction. Within these isotonic contractions, you can have what is called a concentric contraction. So when you're, let's say, lifting weights, the muscle is contracting and shortening as you contract it. That is a concentric contraction. Uh, sometimes what you're going to see a muscle is going to contract as the muscle is lengthening. So when you're like you're running downhill and you're using your legs to break those quads to break. Sometimes what's happening is you're contracting a muscle so you don't have your leg collapse. That is what's called an eccentric contraction. The muscle is lengthening as it contracts. 
what you'll see is these are actually a lot of times way tougher on a muscle. So if you've ever done weightlifting and done negatives, for example, they really make the muscle sore a lot of times afterwards because it is a much tougher on a muscle to do an eccentric contraction where you're contracting the muscle as it's also lengthening because that's kind of going against the contraction. And if you're not careful, like I said, sometimes you can cause more damage to the muscle that way. So like it says here, if you're trying to shovel a load that is too heavy, what type of contraction you're, are you using? This would be an isometric contraction because again, there was no change in that as you're doing that. Uh, so same isometric contraction sometimes will lead to a big increase in blood pressure. So shoveling snow like that, especially if it's too heavy, sometimes you'll bear down and hold your breath. And this can lead to a lot of times big spikes in blood pressure, especially also when you're having vasoconstriction because of the cold. And a lot of times when you hear about people having heart attacks, a lot of times it's shoveling for the first time in the winter, a lot of times is will cause this because it is a big stressor on the heart with those isometric contractions leading to these big spikes in blood pressure, which can cause, like I said, damage to the heart uh, if a blood vessel breaks or something else like that. The other thing I want to talk about here real quick is kind of this idea about muscles length versus how much tension they can generate. Muscles have something that we would kind of refer to as a length tension curve. And really what we're going to see is if a muscle is really overstretched or if it's most of the way to contract, that has less ability to contract more forcefully at those points. So what we're going to see is generally when the fiber is at the resting length, they are capable of generating their maximal force. But if you get a muscle that is already contracted, so if you already have your bicep contracted here and you're just trying to take a little bit more and go that last little bit, that's actually a tougher contraction to do. Same thing if, the, if you're trying to lift a weight. It's like with bench press. If you're all the way down here and the muscles are already lengthened all the way out, it's really hard to get it started. Once you get into the middle of that bench press, it's really easy, but then a lot of times blocking it out at the end gets hard again. And that's because you're at the beginning, you're at a really lengthened muscle, and then when you're getting to the top of the bench press, you're trying to contract it that last little bit when the muscles are already most of the way contracted. You're on the ends of those link tension curves that there's not as quite a much force to be able to generate it. So you can kind of see here, when you're at that resting length, you have this overlap where there's still a decent amount you can do. When you have the muscle fully contracted, you can see there's not a lot of thin fiber still to grab onto, so it's much more difficult to contract that further. Same thing when it's contracted further out here, there's a lot less overlap between these fibers so you don't have as many mice and heads pulling on the actin fibers and it's again more difficult to generate force when the muscle is either fully stretched out or fully contracted when you're in that middle area that's kind of that power curve of any particular muscle and when we start talking about effects of exercise on muscle one of the things that you're going to see is Generally, when you do a lot of weightlifting, what you're doing is you're increasing the size of the muscle cells. So we're increasing hypertrophy. Generally, if you stimulate fibers over and over again, especially if you're causing small micro tears in these ones, you're going to get more uh, actinomycin fibers in here, more myofibrils uh, in this muscle, which increases the size of the muscle, so the muscle gets bigger. That is hypertrophy. Uh, you're also going to have more mitochondria, more energy stores in there, a better ability to generate ATP. What generally doesn't happen as much is hyperplasia. This is an increase in muscle fibers. Lifting weights generally is not going to increase the number of muscle cells you have, but it increases the size of each cell. Uh, we can some get, can get some increases in muscle cell numbers, but that is actually quite limited with exercise. And with muscles, again, if you build all this stuff up, it is generally, and you'll see this with almost anything with the body, it is kind of use it or lose it. If you generate a lot more of this tissue and you stop using that muscle, stop lifting weights, for example, those muscles will go back to the amount of exercise that you're putting on them. Just like the bones did. If you're not putting weight on the bones, you lose bone density. And if you've ever broken a bone, let's say, and had a cast on where you can't use the muscle as much, you will see that change in size of that muscle sometimes as it atrophies. And again, this is less muscle tone, less muscle power. Like it says, it says here, generally reversible, but if there is too much atrophy, that muscle loss can be permanent, especially if there's damage to those muscle cells and they, are, they die. You cannot replace those. 
but even extreme atrophy sometimes is more permanent if you go too long without putting fours on it. So that is it for a lot of what we're going to talk about with skeletal muscle. So the last show in this one is we're going to be we're going to be taking a look at smooth muscle, kind of its structure and a little bit about its contraction process and how it's similar and different from skeletal muscle. So I'll see you again next time.